in person, uh, other, than, other than the fact I've done it for 30 years. So, um, but in any event, we'll work our way through it, and this is everything you wanted and didn't want to know about wood, wood structure. But we're going to learn it anyway because I think it's it's vital to you. Um, it's going to be real important for you to understand. It'll help you understand the way the wood is working in relation to your treatments. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is um, how a tree grows. It, it grows in a conical pattern. You know, it lays down new growth every year. So every year it's 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 laying down new growth and it's getting bigger and taller as it grows. It has to grow. So when it does, um, what's that tell you about the top of the tree versus the bottom of the tree? You know, obviously it's a different age, right? So as you see these, where's the pointer? Well, that wasn't the right one. There it is. So as you see these age growths, uh, you can see it at this at this baseline here. This tree is one, two, three, four, five, maybe six years old. And as it's growing each year, it's adding new growth. But when you get up here, this wood's only a year. You know? So um, that's important uh, for a number of reasons. And what I'll, I'll mention, I'll mention one right off the bat is and I'm sure you guys have heard of juvenile wood. Juvenile wood is defined generally as the first 10 to 12 years of a tree's growth. Okay? And basically what that why that's important is as a as a tree grows, the wood becomes more mature. So in juvenile wood, in wood that's less than 10 to 12 years, the properties of that wood are significantly different than the properties of of the wood outside. So when you get into, uh, you know, the butt of the tree, it's it's going to be a lot. Uh, the wood is more stable. The, the uh, fibers are more mature, able to carry a uh, stronger load. The uh, engineering <laughs> properties are more complete. <clears throat> but at the younger years. They're somewhat less than that. They're 60 to 70 percent of that. They swell more. They shrink more. Uh, so the properties are different, and that's why, you know, sometimes you see things. A board just uh, has a tremendous crook or bow in it. Well, that's because it's juvenile. So that's that's one of the things that the tree growth shows. <laughs> So let's take a, 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 step, a step back and, and look at wood as it is uh, from a macroscopic uh, perspective. Uh, you can see here we've got we've got a mark on the outside that provides protection for the tree. Um, we've got it doesn't show it in here, but right below the bark is uh, a layer called the phloem. The phloem is the part of the bark or the part of the uh, tree that conducts food down from the leaves or the needles down all the way to the roots. Okay, so it's a it's a very vital part of the tree, and that's why if you knock the bark off a tree all the way around it uh, and it gets into that phloem layer, it'll prevent it'll actually girdle the tree and cause the tree to die. Okay, so then there's a layer, also, again, not on this slide, but right at that interface between the phloem and the uh, sapwood called the cambium layer. And that cambium layer produces, it's the active uh, part of the tree that produces the phloem cells to the outside of the tree 
which it has to do because it's growing, right? So it's got to have, it's got to add new cells down as it grows. So it adds cells to the outside called phloem, and it adds cells to the inside called xylem. So xylem, that xylem tissue is this white part of the sapwood that you have. Well, the sapwood's function is to carry all the water up and nutrients up from the, the roots all the way up to the leaves. So it's a, you know, it's really a magnificent thing to think about that water is going up 100 feet in the air and going from the roots all the way up to the, to the top of the tree and that's that's conducted through through this sapwood. Now this part in the middle that we know as heartwood is wood that's no longer alive, it's dead. That the sapwood is still living, it's living cells and functioning as cells, but the but the heartwood is, is dead. And basically what happens as as those cells die, the living cells die, they're transported, the, the material, cellular material is transported through the ray cells. That that word will come back later on, but it's transported from the outside to the inside of the tree. So it's using that as storage. Now, species are, are different. They, uh, in the South, we have what's called, you know, uh, small uh, hardwood, uh, thin hardwood uh, species. It's, it's got mostly sapwood with a small amount of hardwood, whereas out West, the fir, yellow cedar, uh, red cedar, those, those species have high hardwood con uh, content, a very thin layer of sapwood. So th all those things will come into play on how you, you treat. <coughs> and in this section, the other obvious thing we see there are the growth rings. Okay? Growth rings uh, as a tree is is growing in the springtime uh, in the early wood it, it forms the cells are a lot larger the cell wall is thinner and uh, it's it's laden with with moisture as as the summer ends uh, the amount of say uh, the, the what's called the vacuole or the cell lumen shrinks, the cell wall thickens, and you get these high density, it doesn't, it's not growing as, at a faster rate, so this part becomes real dense, and you, and you see the rings, those form the rings, the annual rings. That obviously comes into play in, in treatment because you've got to get chemical, it's easy to get chemical through, through there, it's a little harder to get it through the liquid. Now I say that with a caveat. The caveat being that that in sapwood uh, or in early wood, the pits that regulate the flow of water are much more pliable. In in late wood, they're less pliable, so they're less likely to get aspirated, and we'll get into that later. Okay, one other thing to note here, <coughs> sorry if I'm in y'all's way, but, uh, one other thing to note here is the, what is called, what's an anisotropic uh, material? And what that means is that it has properties that differ in different directions. So this longitudinal section, that's going from the roots, that's what we normally think of, right? Um, in the tangential section, that's tangent to the rings. So in other words, it's like, <coughs> it's like plain sawn or flat sawn material, okay? 
and then the tree <coughs> is coming from the center of the tree out. And those three surfaces have different properties. So you see the cross section here. That's got one property because that's the longitudinal orientation. The radial has a different property and the tangential as well. So just keep in mind those three directions uh, or orientations of rings as we go along. Okay, let's take a look now about them uh, a little bit deeper, a little more less uh, macroscopic and look at a little more microscopic <coughs> level. Um, this is a, a typical uh, pattern of wood that you see. Uh, it's just taking a little cube out of that cross-sectional uh, orientation. And you see here, this is the cross-section or the longitudinal direction is going up and down. Here is the tangential section that's going uh, side to side or in, in, in tangent to the rings. And this would be the radial section. You note the, the cellular structure. The cells are oriented uh, like soda straws. Okay, so that's, that's really what that is, is akin to. So water is going to move up that pretty freely, um, but even more, you know, are, are also prominent is in the radial direction, if you see these, uh, um, if you see these ray cells, these are big cells that are uh, arranged uh, in, a, in a radial orientation, and they're kind of like a, Super highway in into the wood, so uh, the wood will uh, the cells will, and I'll get more into it in a second. But uh, solution uh, from your treatments will go in through these, and you see these pits, and the solution will then migrate through those pits into these tracheids, and then flow up and down from there. So keep in mind, again, the orientation uh, and, and the grain directions and, and the effects that, that they have. Okay, so if you look at cell types, this longitudinal trachea is, is the biggest cell that we see in wood. It is uh, arranged in the longitudinal direction, so you, you can see that as it goes in, or I'm sorry, as it as it goes along, it, it, these things can be actually millimeters in length. You know, they're pretty uh, pretty large in relation to uh, both the diameter of it and in relation to other cells. <coughs> the longitudinal parenchyma and epithelial cells are are not real important. The epithelial cells surround a resin canal. Okay, um, I didn't point that out on the last slide. This is a resin canal. These little cells around it. It's basically uh, like a donut hole. Okay, and these epithelial cells uh, surround this void. And what will happen as the tree gets injured? Uh, it'll conduct resin up and down as needed uh, through these epithelial cells will secrete the resin and they'll go up and down through these canals to uh, attend to whatever injury there is. Um, again, the ray tracheids and the ray parenchyma form the ray cells. Ray cells, like I said, are kind of like the the interstate system into the into the from the outside to the inside of the tree. Okay, there are three different uh, 
pit types, and you know, I realized that as a wood guy, I'm, I really get into this stuff, and some of you guys may not <laughs> may not get into it the same way, but this stuff is real important, in, in particular, to you. Uh, pits are valves, essentially. They're valves that regulate the flow of liquid from one cell to another cell. And there's three different types. So this is what's called a simple pit. And you got a cell on this side and a cell on this side, and it's just got a straight pit, a straight pathway. It's got a large aperture, and the solution just pass right through. Okay? This is called a bordered pit pair. And so you got a pair of pits, one on each side, uh, that's got this border. And basically, it's a horn that kind of is on either side. And why this is important is because the membrane that forms in between these two cells is thickened in the middle. And that's called the torus. And what'll happen is, as it needs to regulate uh, flow from one cell to the other, this pit can become aspirated. And it'll get pushed up against the sides of these, these borders, and it'll stop the flow of solution. And this is just a combination of these two. It's, it's got a border pit pair on one side, in this longitudinal trachea this way, and then it's got a simple pit on this side uh, with the orientation of the cell going straight in. So these two are perpendicular because uh, this would be a ray cell on this side. This would be uh, a regular longitudinal, longitudinal trachea on this side. This is an actual micrograph of a border pit pair that had been cut. And you can see that it's got this thickened portion right here called the torus. It's where all these fibers just are matted together and it's thick. And that, this area right here is the margo, and that's just the membrane that holds that uh, torus in place. And it's formed from the middle lamella, which is the <coughs> material that's between two different, two different cells, two adjoining cells. You can see these openings. These are the openings that you have to pass solution through. So you can see that's about two microns there. So that's about a two microns long and maybe a micron wide. So that's that's the size of the openings that you that you have. So let's talk about flow. I mentioned earlier you got you have water going 100 feet up in the air. Um, how does that happen? Uh, the answer is they don't really know. Okay, there, you can't explain it by capillary action. You know can't really explain it by diffusion, you know, you can't really explain it by bulk flow, you know, you can, you can get up on a ladder and suck a straw, you know, you, you can't suck it high enough to get it all the way to the top. So, really don't really know the answer, how, how uh, water gets up from the roots all the way up to leaves, but we can't tell you how it gets from your, your treating solution into your wood. Uh, uh, diffusion's not really it. Diffusion may help in certain, uh, certain applications, and we'll talk about that uh, next. John will mention that. Uh, capillary action is not, not really the way it works, not sufficient. So what we're going to concern ourselves with is the bulk flow. we got a formula for that. <laughs> It's engineers, they like formulas. It's just basically saying that the amount of pressure uh, on one side versus what it is on the other is proportional to the 
span that it has to go and to the size of the uh, aperture. Which, you know, basically uh, I threw this in there to, to talk about permeability. Permeability is, is the measure, a way of measuring the uh, ease by which the liquids flow through the wood, where treatability is, is more concerned with can I get it to where I need it and can I get it at the retentions that I need. So if we look at uh, flow in a longitudinal direction, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, there are these resin canals that are really large. Uh, you can see those with the naked eye in southern pine. Uh, there are little dots in the, in the rings. And, uh, and you can, uh, they conduct quite a bit of solution through the wood once it's dried. Um, the other and, and primary method of flow is through these longitudinal <coughs> tracheids, which is the cell lumen on the inside of the cell. Uh, so that's that's how it's those are the structures through which it's conducted the solution is conducted through the wood. If you looked at it, the other structure that you can't really see in that slide, uh, the previous slide, is these pits and between the uh, the overlap of these longitudinal tracheids, there's a, a pit between them. There's more than one, but this pit allows for solution to go from in a longitudinal direction from one trachea to the, to the trachea above it uh, by going through the, this aperture, this pit aperture, and going around the torus and then back through into the next adjoining cell. Now, if you're looking at it in a radial direction, how do, how do the, what are the structures that conduct it? So, again, the ray cells are made of ray parenchyma, and that's these cells here that are on the uh, top of it that form this resin. Uh, this is a resin canal here. And these ray cells and resin canals usually occur <coughs> together. And uh, so those are the two main pathways, this big resin canal and these ray cells that carry the solution in from, uh, from the outside into the wood. They, they connect with these, lo these longitudinal tracheids uh, through pits. You get some you get some flow through radial pits as well, but it's it's limited. You can see that one is less likely to uh, make a significant difference as opposed to the, the resin canals and the ray cells. Finally there's flow in a tangential direction. That's what this is. That's these pits that you have uh, going from one cell again to the adjoining cell through these uh, and then through these cross field pitting. So here's this resin canal. These are the ray cells by it and then there's pits that carry that open that to the adjoining cells uh, tracheids down here and that's how the solution gets into those cells. This is just a, a schematic of, of ray cells uh, and where they meet with longitudinal tracheids and they go through these, these pits here. And that's what they look like in early. <coughs> so you can see it's easy to flow from, from uh, that pit or this, this uh, ray cell into a trachea because it's got these, these wide open. That's what it is in the uh, early wood. Uh, in the late wood, it's, it's a little more compact. Now, I spent a lot of time this morning trying to get you used to the, the 
concept of the orientation of the wood um, and how its effect on, on treatment. So if you look at a piece of uh, lumber, it's cut, this is going to be flat sawn, you know, it's cut tangent to the rings, okay, and this is a piece of quarter sawn where the rings are, uh, are cut tangent to, or tangent to, the, to the narrow face, here they're cut tangent to the wide face. Well, I want you to think about that because what happens, we, we've already talked about that wood, the solution goes through wood mostly from the end grain, right? It will go further uh, through the end grain. You soak it. You said, uh, you know, they were talking, uh, James was talking earlier about uh, them soaking logs in. Uh, in copper solutions and it would come up from the bottom. Well, it does. It comes up to a limited extent. It's, it's probably uh, on a pure volume. It's probably 10 times greater penetration from the ends than you get radially, which is 10 times greater than you get tangentially, okay, from side to side. So when you get a piece like this, let's think about it. You've got you know, it may be an inch and a half thick right here, right? Maybe, oh, whatever, 10 inches wide or six inches wide, however you want to think about it. Um, but all it has to do, since most of the solution travels in a radial direction, that is, like in this direction, it's only got to come in three quarters of an inch from the bottom, three quarters of an inch from the top, and boom, that's treated. So that piece is going to treat a hell of a lot easier than this piece where the radial direction is now on the narrow face and it's got to come in that same 10 inches, you know. And since generally there's heartwood here, it's going to block this side so it's all going to have to come in from this direction because you only get very little tangential envelope treatment from that direction. So. Now, I didn't do this, but I know that Gary Kellum, when he was inspector, would go drill those if he didn't buy lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in doing that, you, just be aware you're treating tube 10, tube 12s, they're coming out of what? The center of the log, right? They're coming out of that, they're going to be harder to treat. This is a little. <coughs> I had it in this order, but uh, this is just a little diagram on how pit <coughs> aspiration occurs. You can see in, in this case, you've got a uh, liquid level here, and you've got an air pocket. Uh, it gets disrupted, and if the pressure is greater on this side than it is on this side, then it, it can push that pit up against or the, the torus up against the, the uh, borders. And that's what's happened in this particular slide. You can see you got a, a border here and a border here and the same on this side and this torus has gotten pushed up against that and that's going to aspirate that pit. It's going to prevent solution going from here across into this cell. What causes pit aspiration? Drying. Drying can do it. Uh, pressure differences can do it. You know, we, we institute, and, and I'll get into this a little bit later, we institute what's called a slow pressure release. You know, yeah, that's, that's time and that's a concern, but what does that do if you, if you <coughs> release the pressure between these two sides, you're less likely to aspirate the number of pits and and can get better flow and better recovery back out during final vacuum. So generally we like to try to slow that, that pressure release down. Now I've got in here a, a this comment that flow is greater in sapwood than it is in hardwood. Obviously you know that. Um, it's, it's actually greater in latewood 
lived in earlier the word water. And that's why there's what's known as, uh, you know, the uh, fiber saturation point. When those <coughs> when the fibers of the cell wall are saturated with, with water, but there's no water in the cell lumen, that's called fiber saturation point. It's more theoretical than it is actual, but as you dry down your piece of lumber and it goes, it gets to excessive uh, moisture contents of like 10% or less. Well, now you, you've, you've shrunk that, that wood together and you can't, get, it takes a while to get that moisture back in. So it's kind of like a zipper, you know, it's, it, 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 it's kind of got to wedge its way in there and spread them apart enough to uh, allow the, the treatment to, to go through. Uh, there's some things you can do uh, with your, uh, your with your solution. You know, it gets dirty after much use. One thing that we found uh, in, in all our testing was that new solutions treat great. Right? I mean, you, you make up a fresh solution and you treat it, you're going to get the best treatment that the solution is going to give you right out, right out the gate. Because it gets it gets wood fibers, it gets wood sugars uh, into that solution. Reactions are, are occurring. Those in turn, they get dirt. Uh, all that starts affecting penetration in later charges. So uh, some things you can do is to uh, uh, eliminate the particulates in, in, your, in your solution. You can run it through a bag filter, get some of that stuff out. Uh, or you just treat it off you know, and start again. But you can see some of the things that, that affect the flow of, of solution. And again, some of the surface tension, and that's built in in viscosity, uh, which is built in into the, the uh, chemistry of, of your preserver. Uh, these are some things that that we found on the suggestions is easier said than done, but uh, nonetheless are, are important. Source your wood from wood that's more easily treated. There are, in fact, uh, <coughs> you know the mills that you can treat and the mills you can't, and that's, that's important. Uh, you know, don't over dry the wood, but dry it enough to, to get treated. You have to get that free water out of there in order to be able to treat. You can't treat totally saturated wood. Uh, filter your solutions. Use up old solutions by using uh, full cell treatments. Uh, and you can try alternating your treating schedules, but those, uh, your treating cycles, but uh, they're not as effective at, at getting penetration is problematic. So. so that's it. If there are any comments, entertain any questions.